to this. So part of the issue we have on this show, and we've done this many, many times, is people giving generic financial advice as if it's some sort of rock solid thing. Now, it's not necessarily all bad, but it doesn't work for most people. <clears throat> and I'm gonna show you this real quick. And, and here's something from PBS. And a guy did this thing and it was the, everything you need to know about finance you can put on an index card. Oh no. <laughs> and he and, this, he and this woman wrote a book about it, yep. So we're gonna watch a little bit of this. We're gonna go through what he talks about. And I'm gonna show you why it doesn't make sense. It could not get any simpler. All the financial advice you really need might just fit on a four by six index card. And in the next eight minutes, our economics correspondent, Paul Salmon, will fill you in and let you know what the secret is. It's part of our weekly Making Sense report, which airs every Thursday on the News Hour. We use Fidelity's analytics to spot trends, gain insights, and figure All right, out what you want. little ad. Let's skip right to the guy. Policy professor Harold Pollack. So the guy's a health policy professor, and he's now he's issuing financial advice. Who lives in Flossmore, Illinois, 20 miles from campus. About personal finance until recently, he knew squat. And I sort of figured it would all work out, and I didn't have to think about it too much. And so I did it. Until that is, he had to, when in 2003, his mother-in-law died suddenly, leaving her disabled son in the Pollock's hands. The expenses of caring for someone who is quite disabled, you know, are very frightening. Uh, when Vincent moved into our home, he was about 340 pounds, and we needed to get furniture that, that would fit him. One time we had to go out and just buy a recliner, and it was something like $900. And there were hospitalizations, medical bills. Pollock needed advice. So this so was all good stuff. So he basically went online, did his own research, hooked up with somebody, sort of a financial guru type, this woman here. Lane Olin over Skype. At one point he said offhandedly. For the, most part, the really good advice is a, can fit on a three by five index card and is available for free in the library. This time around, Helene Olin joined virtually once again. And so they agreed on that and they wrote a book. <laughs> With the index cards. I mean, that's that's the problem I have. Is that that they wrote a book? No, no. That uh, I knew nothing about personal finance. I googled some shit, and now I'm selling it as if I'm an expert. That yeah, I don't love that part. That's my problem. So let's go into some of the stuff on the card because it's not bad shit. I mean, it's, it's she might actually have some sort of. Um, no, she's done maybe, some financial advising, but she's not. I don't know what her certifications are, if she has any. I couldn't find anything. But let's see if we can go. They have the, he wrote them down. Let's see, we'll skip them. So rule one, strive to save 10 to 20% of your income. Okay, yeah, not a bad idea, right? I mean, any complaints on that end? I mean, it's, if you can. I don't have an issue with that one. I mean, the percentage you can manage will be, you know, based on a lot of personal factors, but striving for savings of 10 to 20%. Yeah. I mean, that, that's been, that's been sort of generic advice that's been put out there forever. Ever. That's kind of always been sort of one of the things more if you can, but right. I mean, for at least that, you know? Right. But let's say you're saving that a lot of that's going, they get to 20% and you're saving that for retirement and all that. And we've already discussed that, uh, half of Amer half of working Americans make 54,000 a year or less. Right. So of the 211 million working people, 106 million people make 54 grand or less. Right. So 54,000, all right. Let's say they're able to save. Well, we won't factor in tax, but let's say they're able to save 10%, 20%, right? So they're saving 10,000 a year, right? But what that means is 54,000 minus 10 grand. So they've got 44 um, that they saved and then we'll factor in tax. 
Now they're talking about you'd have to be living off of twenty nine hundred dollars a month. So you'd have to be living below, pretty much below, almost one hundred and fifty percent of the poverty line. Yeah, but I mean, that doesn't necessarily. I haven't read their book, but to play devil's advocate, maybe they mean ten to twenty percent of your take home, not your gross. Well, but they're yeah, we could do it that way too. But let's say. But let's say we did the take home just for, for safety's sake, right? And let's say you got average market return, less 20 year return is 8%. And you did that for over 30 years. The future value, you'd have $1.1 million in savings for retirement over a 30 year period. That sounds great, right? However, if you factor in inflation, right? That's only the equivalent of about $380,000 today. And so if you factor in, okay, let's say you need that for 25 years in retirement. Um, that would be, let's see, do I correct? No. That would be $2,900 a month to live off of. So that and maybe some social security, what you haven't done is you haven't ever improved your lifestyle and you save 20% and you're still in the same bracket. All right, let's play devil's advocate again because I like doing that. Sure. So you haven't improved your lifestyle, but even at the sort of flat line scenario, well, I'd like to see a person improve their lifestyle. I would like to see them be able to retire at all. And under that scenario, at least they can. Yeah. Uh, because I'm sorry, I'm so tired of hearing people being like, well, my plan is to die at my desk. No. What if you can't? What if, what if you can't keep being at your desk, you know? Anyway. Yeah. Well, I would argue the better, the better solution is, is, to say, okay, yeah, strive to save 10 to 20% if you can, because that's how you're going to survive. But just realize you're not going to get ahead doing that. You're not really going to get anywhere. You're going to basically be in the same economic scenario you are. That's the reality. Now, the question... That is initially, the only part of that advice I wasn't liking is that it gives a relatively low dollar amount, some sort of like a safety stamp in people's minds. You know what I mean? Oh, I'm doing that amount. I'm sure I'll be fine, right? Right. That's my point. Yeah. And it doesn't really solve anything. Because then like he has that situation where, oh my gosh, my brother-in-law is moving in and he's disabled and I have to take care of a third person. And now there's all those extra expenses I didn't plan for. Now things are worse. Right? This is taking into account that nothing goes wrong over 30 years. What are the odds that's going to happen? Nobody's that lucky. Anyway, but that's my point is it doesn't solve the problem, right? The problem, once again, is still the wealth inequality problem we just talked about with Paul Krugman. It's not. So these are just little band-aids to what is a bigger problem. So when these guys slap this advice like it's genius, it's not. It's the basic band-aid solution that you can do day to day but it doesn't solve the problem. It's not going to get you anywhere. It's certainly not going to help you achieve a realistic goal. Um, so there's that one. Well, so we can go to a couple more of these. Rule two, pay your credit card balance in full every month. Yeah, if you can, you absolutely should do that. I don't, yeah. really, I don't really have a complaint about that. That's a pretty simple one. Um, max out your 401k. Yep, always, if you can. If you can. If you can, you should absolutely do it. That's not easy, though, by the way. I, the, the only issue that I have with that one is the, that rule is that rule doesn't say strive to. It says, it says to do it. Right. And, and now that's just a matter of I'm nitpicking at words, but I'm also an English teacher, so I'm going to nitpick at the words. But that's making it sound like you, you just can. And, you know. Not everybody if, can afford to, yeah. If, right. If. Get that fifty-four thousand that we talk about, you know, on fifty-four thousand, you're maxing that out. 
Well, plus rule. That's, that, that's like shaving off 20 grand off the top before you even deal in taxes and all of that stuff. Then, then you're living off of 30,000 before the taxes are taken out. I mean, that's, it, it's assuming a lot to assume that people just can right. max those. Once again, all this assumes you're making over 70 K you're in the top 25% of earners in the United States. Depending on what area of the country you live in. Yeah. I mean, yeah. In your I'm circumstance. Sorry, I'm, now, I'm a teacher and your average teacher here in New York city makes 70 K or higher. And, but that didn't go anywhere. It, it, yeah. Still having them max that out. Some of them can, but many of them very simply cannot, and it's not for lack of effort. Oh, no. I, I made a significant amount of money in Honolulu, but I can make, uh, gosh, 60% of that here in, in Oregon, and it goes a lot farther. Mm -hmm. Even though I was making a lot more money in Honolulu, that money was gone at the end of the month. It was There was just no way to afford anything. The other thing about the, the 401k thing, remember we talked about last time, 57 million employers don't even provide 401ks or if they do they especially don't match so you're talking probably easily a hundred plus million how almost half of american workers don't have a retirement plan through their work especially if you're working as like somebody in the service industry you're working as a waitress or a waiter or a cook or you know a bartender or something like that a lot of those businesses can't afford it. So, I mean, like I said, this, this sort of, it sounds all nice and good until you actually look at it per person and what it, how many people it affects. Because most of what he said so far only affects about half of American workers, the upper half. It doesn't affect, the bottom half are fucked on this. And that's the problem. The Krugman was pointing out that, like I said, we this this is the easy way to ignore it. Just do these things and it should all work out. So if you're not successful, it's because you're not following the index card. Not because the system screwed you. Not because you're in a bad position, right? So let's go back. So never buy or sell individual stocks. Probably good advice unless you know what you're doing. I'm not going to go into that one too much. Um, we'll skip ahead here. What is it? Five. Buy inexpensive, well-diversified indexed mutual funds and ETF, the exchange-traded funds. Uh, uh, first off, index funds are not diversified. They're, they're tied to an index. They're, they're not diversified. So the S&P, if you buy an index, an S&P 500 index fund, it's not diversified. It's tied to the U.S. market. Whatever the U.S. market does, it's going to do. Generally speaking, taking the word diversified out of the equation, for the average person to focus on index funds, etc., isn't necessarily a bad thing. If you're under fun, if you're under forty five or fifty, yeah, I would say that's fine. Once you get above fifty, it starts getting dangerous. Well, but my point though is comparing that to people that don't want to do their homework but want to buy individual stocks. Comparatively, going toward an index fund of some sort would That's, be a, a better way to go. It's fine. Yeah. It's fine. I'm just I'm just pointing out that this is guy is supposed to say this is all you need to know, and there's already something severely wrong. Just it's not diversified. He doesn't know what the word means in finance, financial terms, at least. Um, but yeah, that's fine. Index mutual funds. The other thing about mutual funds, kids, you got to remember, are they front loaded? Are they back loaded? Are they no load? You have to know yeah. what, what the fees sure. are. I spent a lot of time with my clients just trying to teach them to understand the difference between these different kinds of fees, which ones we're avoiding and how much is too much right. for different types of them. Just so when they're looking at something, they don't feel lost. Exchange traded funds are probably the, the cheaper, better way to go. If you buy an exchange traded index fund, it's the same as buying a mutual fund, only it costs probably a 20th. Right, you don't have to deal with the load at all. No, because there's no, ma there's no manager. So, right. yeah. So, I mean, there's not a ton more. We can do the rest of these if you want, but 
I just wanted to point out there's kind of this there's kind of the the point of look everybody kind of recognizes income inequality as a problem that's not really up for debate i'm certain people will but it's not so that's the issue but the question is is all right we kind of know what the problem is we kind of know what's causing it is there's too much wealth at the top right the question is is that how do we fix that well the arguments that we look at all the time in finance and they never really directly say it but it's the same kind of thing this guy's doing is just follow these 10 steps or these seven steps and everything will be fine and you'll get ahead and da 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 but that's not the case right and the idea is that if you're not succeeding and if things are going bad it's because you're not following the right steps or you're stupid or you're lazy or something else and when you do that excuse, then the only real answer to income inequality is, well, some people are wealthy just because they deserve to be. And the people that are poor are poor because they're lazy or they're stupid, which goes back to our whole joke we used to do with um, that bit from Mr. Show, Worthington's Law, the idea that the more money you have equals the better person you are and thus beyond criticism. <laughs> But that's not true. But they kind of want to shoehorn it in there. And that's kind of what this does unintentionally. I'm not saying this guy's being villainous about it, but it is kind of unintentional to sit there and say, well, if you just do these 10 things, well, that's all the financial advice you need. That's all you need to know. Well, gee, there you go. <laughs> then there's no nuance to anything. We don't need to fix anything in the system. Just everybody follow these 10 steps. Yeah, and we, why don't we just take the word personal out of personal finance because it, it then no longer is. Yeah, just we'll just make it, you know, whatever the whatever the machine pumps out. That's what you need to be. Uh -huh.